morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Amanda Nicholson, and uh, I am part of the Renewal Lab team here. And we are in a process of renewal, and it's so exciting. And so before I talk about what I'm supposed to talk about, I just want to welcome so many visitors today. I see familiar faces that I know from my home in PEI, and so good to see you. And for the ones that I don't know, there's coffee after church, and uh, we're so excited you're here. And we hope that your rally is going good and that you're growing closer to God and that it's a growing experience for you. And um, I also, while I'm up here talking, I just want to draw your attention to these prayer cards. Um, they're kind of hard to spot, but they're on the table in the foyer when you walk in. And we just are really asking that you keep us in prayer. Um, our church needs prayer, and it needs prayer from all of you. So on this card is a, a card that you can take home, and it's a, it's a reminder of the things that we want you to pray for us for. And then on the back, there's some empty spaces that you can write what you want to pray about. And it just helps you to be really intentional about your prayers and really get close to God and join us in our journey. So I'll ask you to stand and join us in singing, You Are Holy.
Psalms 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies, to because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you have mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with the glory of and honor. You made him rule over the works of your hands and put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air and the fish of the seas, and the and all that swim in the path of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Good morning. I'm Harold Winter. I get the privilege of being the pastor here. Glad that you're here as well. And as God calls us to worship with those words from Psalm 8, we're going to come close to God in prayer. Please join me. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you have gathered us here to this place. We're thankful that you're God over all creation. It takes our breath away to see stars and the galaxies and the way that they are so far away so beautiful. But then we think of the world on that scope and we kind of wonder, well, who are we that, that you actually care about us? And so as we think about some of those things in this worship service today, we pray that you meet with us by your Holy Spirit, that you strengthen those who participate in the service and those who lead in the service, so that what's done here can glorify your name and be encouraging and building for each person that's here. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we go from this place, we can be amazed at how great you are. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're gathered here because there's nowhere else to go. That our help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. God greets his people saying, Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. We're going into a set of songs now that will lead us into reflecting on God's grace. We begin with Abba Father.
to a man or elected on your lap? <coughs> Whatever I got. <coughs> well, good morning. I was glad to see some of you out yesterday. You were out helping us today. And well. Anyway, the pastor sermon is called Who Are You? And who are you guys? Is there one thing? Kids? Yeah, you're kids. Christian. Oh, I was hoping someone would say that. But what's a Christian? Somebody who believes in God and believes in Jesus and believes also what? The that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Now, I got some pictures here. And I hope you guys look at that picture there. Can everybody see that picture? Is that a Christian? How about this guy? You don't know. Oh, maybe we meet a we meet a girl. This girl maybe looks like a Christian, right? No? Boy, I'm not that found. Oh, here's one. Well, can't, can't we tell by looking at a person if they're a Christian? But how do we tell them? Ask questions. There's some other ways. I remember song said, uh, you will know we are Christians by uh, our love. Right on. And how do we show that? That's a good idea. And what if you see somebody at school being bullied? You stand up for them, and if you're a little nervous about doing that, go to somebody, and some adult, and tell them, and then tell them later on. And how else? Hmm, that's pretty difficult, isn't it? It's pretty difficult to sh What's that? Give money to the poor. I don't imagine you guys have too much money, but all that helps. And people will see you doing these things, and maybe they'll come to you and say, are you a Christian? And then that's your chance. That's your chance to tell them why you're a Christian and what you do as a Christian. And I was kind of disappointed years ago. I went to a rally, a men's rally, and... I met a, a couple of mounted policemen that I've worked with over the years. And I said, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. And they said, well, I didn't know you were either. So it's somewhere along the line we failed, didn't we? Because they didn't know. I guess we didn't show it by the way we act. So maybe we can all bow our heads and pray to God that they'll give us chances to show that we're a Christian. Heavenly Father, you know we love you, but do other people know? Give us the chances and give us the courage to stand out and say we are Christians and we love Jesus. We love you. Help us all through the week so that we can do things that will glorify your name. This we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, for Three and four years old can go downstairs and the rest go back to their boat. <coughs> At this point, we're going to uh, have opportunity to worship God by giving, maybe not completely to the poor, but to the ministries of our church, the first plate, and the second plate will be for your Redeemer University College. If you're visiting, don't feel obligated to put anything in either plate. Just pass it along. Uh, this is our way of worshiping God together. After the offering is taken, the director of Youth Unlimited is going to uh, spend a minute or two. He promises it's not going to be five or six. Um, giving his greetings.
Good morning. As a, a way of introduction, my name is Jeff Kreidoff. Um, I reside um, in Holland, Michigan, uh, not the Netherlands, but in Michigan. And um, just a little bit about myself, uh, just to make a connection here. Um, I've been married for 20 years to my high school sweetheart. I have three daughters. Um, the oldest is in grade 11, and the youngest is in grade 5, and thinks she's going into grade 11. Um, I also um, have been born and raised in a Christian Reformed congregation, much, much like this one. Um, the congregation that I currently serve in um, was pastored by Keith Dornboss, the person who is leading your renewal lab. In fact, I was the president of their council for many years, serving alongside of Pastor Keith. I was looking in your bulletin this morning, and I see a last name of Compagner. Like, I don't know who that is, but I can tell you that my, there we go, my mother is a compagner. So I'm good, I'm feeling right at home here. <laughs> I, I was uh, driving up with uh, Pastor Zan to come to the rally on uh, Friday, and I said to Zan, I looked over to him and said, you know, when God starts creating my home someday, it's going to look a little bit like this. Where I was driving through Maine and up into New Brunswick. I love this, this setting that you have the um, chance to live in. But anyway, I serve as Executive Director of Youth Unlimited. I've had the privilege of doing that now for the past eight years. Some of you with a little more life experience, uh, no, no, in other words, my age and older, um, <laughs> might know it as the Young Calvinist Federation and the conventions. You know, just a, a, a real quick little uh, timeline. Do you know that in 1919 is when the organization started called the Association of Reformed Young Men Societies, and then the Young Women Society started, and then it became the United Calvinist Youth, and then GEMS and Cadets started, and then it became the Young Calvinist Federation, and today I stand here, Youth Unlimited, almost 100 years later. Do you know who started that? Congregations like you, leagues like the Maritime League, who came together and said, we are better if we are together than if we are alone. Um, I want us to stand here this morning and say thank you to your congregation, because I know that you have been one of those who have said we are better together. You've attended things like the YCF convention. You've hosted swim students. You've been on serve. You, you've used the Youth Unlimited Compass 21 program several years ago. You've hosted the YU Summit in Halifax. You sent students last year to the Chicago Project. You've graciously given me one of your members, Roger Dross, to serve on my board for the last eight years. You are a part of assisting churches to show the love of Christ so that they will go out and live this world for him. Today, Youth Unlimited serves um, is best known by our serve. We'll have 30 mission trips, serve mission trips this summer. We'll have a live it event this summer that will see upwards of 1,800 students this morning hearing about the love of Jesus Christ and being challenged to share it. That's about 100 or 180 congregations that will partner in that ministry. Your church is one of them that over the years have joined in. You know that that is only led there's only five, and again, so I know sometimes when you say Grand Rapids, people kind of cringe. I know. <laughs> it's true. Everywhere I go. So don't feel like you're alone if you're saying that. Do you know there's only five of us in Grand Rapids that make that happen? And do you know that the five of us in Grand Rapids, I have been there the longest at eight years. I've had two that are there for five years, one that's there for three years, one that's only been there for one year. But you know that this organization and the congregations like yours, we have been around for almost 100 years. So it's not us in Grand Rapids that are investing in the students. It's you. It's churches like yours that have committed to investing in the lives of the students. And that's why it is so good for me to be here and to see what your church is investing into these students, even through this weekend's rally. So let me just, uh, again, as I do... Go sit back down. Let me just encourage you to continue on. Continue on. I get to so many churches as I travel across the United States and Canada where we used to see groups, youth groups of 
20 and 30 and 40, now sending kids groups of five and three and one. Because they've, they've lost the ability to communicate and show what it really means to live for Christ. They've, they've, they've gone astray and kids are leaving because they don't see authentic Christ followers. My brother is an electrician. I have another brother that works on an excavator. I've got another uh, sister-in-law that's a teacher. And I need to know that my nieces and nephews and my own children, when we come home at night and we sit at the dinner table, my kids and my nieces and nephews are hearing how how their parents are living, my brothers and sisters are living for Christ every day and what opportunities God gave them to show the love of Christ in their life. So keep doing it. Don't stop. Because they need you. And the church needs them. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you this morning. Philippians 3, 4b to 14. If anyone else thinks he has no reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in the regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church for the legalistic righteousness and faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more? I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection 
and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to obtain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Dearly loved people of God, who are you? I don't know, for some of you it might be a bit of a pressing question on a retreat like this. You kind of wonder where you fit in, who you're going to hang out with, who you're going to sleep in the same cabin with. But I'm not just thinking of that stuff. I'm thinking on a, on a broader level as well. What's at the core, what's at the root of your identity. Who are you? Who are you? I chose to preach on this because I knew that the theme of your rally was going to center around Jesus' question in Mark chapter 8, where Jesus confronts his disciples and says, well, who do people say that I am and who do you say that I am? And so taking off from there, the other side of the question then goes back to who are you? When you look at those two questions together, they kind of are essential questions that philosophers and theologians take time to debate and talk about and wonder about and argue. Did I mention debate? If you were to pull an intro to theology textbook off of, the, off of the shelf and in my study or in any other pastor's study, the first two questions that get addressed, and almost every single one of them, are those two questions. Who's God and who are you? And you could take this question on a really, really broad level to talk about all the people that ever existed. And that's what David did in that psalm that Austin read at the beginning of the worship service. He looked at all of humanity and said, well, who is mankind? What is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. And he starts to unpack that and, and think about that in relation to all of creation. But the passage that we read from the book of Philippians, the letter to the church in Philippi, Paul tackles this question in a much more personal way. He publicly describes how he thinks about himself. And he gives two pictures. He gives a before picture and he gives an after picture. This is how I used to think about myself. And this is how I think about myself now. And Paul began with a, with a really positive view of himself. He was, he was pretty pumped about who he was. And he had been shaped, after all, by his values that he grew up with in his home. His family's values. His community's values. The religion that he belonged to. Their values shaped him. And since his dad was a Pharisee, and since his dad was pursuing righteousness by his efforts, Paul said, well, that's what I want to be like when I grow up. I want to be like dad. Actually, I want to do better than dad does. So I'm going to be a Pharisee too. And Paul was really good at being a Pharisee. In fact, he says in his letter to the Galatians, he describes that he was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age among his, my people, was extremely zealous for the traditions of his fathers. He was a nerd for religion. And he got excited about it. But that was the cool thing in his day and in his place. To really, really pursue righteousness. To do everything you could to look as righteous in God's eyes and the religious ruler's eyes as you could. And so he did it. 
and he was really good at it. So that all of his hopes, all of his dreams, all of his aspirations, what he wanted to be when he grew up, was all wrapped around that religious identity. And the confidence that Paul had, the pride that he had in that identity, is evident from the brag sheet that he had. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised in the eighth day? Check. Of the people of Israel? Check. Of the tribe of Benjamin? Check. Why is that important? Well, the, the temple of God was built in the region, the land, that had been given to the Benjamin, to the tribe of Benjamin. And so, Paul was one of that tribe, and so he was one of the people really close to the, people of, uh, to the temple of God. And he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Check. Some people think that that meant that he spoke Hebrew in his home growing up. That as, even in the town of Tarsus, where he lived and grew up, even there, his parents said, you know what's important for us to teach this kid how to speak Hebrew from the very beginning ages. And so there he is. He's got this stuff made. All these things are things that he didn't have control over. But they were, were given to him, extended to him. And he took a great deal of pride in this. This is what his identity was all wrapped about. But then he built on that. He got a great start, but then he built on that. that these efforts are significant in his pursuit of righteousness, in his pursuit of impressing God. So in regard to a Pharisee, well, in regard to the law, he's a Pharisee. The Pharisees are well known because they wanted to be the people after God's own heart, just like David was. And so they worked really, really hard to say, if it's in the law, I'm going to do it. And they defined, and they purged it out, and they figured it all out, and they pursued it with wholehearted excitement. And so that's what he did. He was a Pharisee. As for zeal, well, he said, these people that are part of the way, followers of Jesus, they are not looking to the law. They're, they're tearing this stuff down. They don't respect Moses or the prophets. I am going to stamp this thing out. And he had the full blessing of the Sadducee leaders and the Pharisee leaders to go out and persecute the church. And said, so this is going to make God really, really happy with me. I'm going to stamp this thing out. And when he took a look at the law, he could put a check mark beside all of them. For righteousness based on the law, he could stand in front of anybody and say, you know what, I got this thing made. I'm faultless. Sitting pretty, wasn't he? He had this righteousness thing hammered down. And his whole identity, his whole reason for being was wrapped up in that. I know this was written a long time ago. It was written far, far away. You see what he's done, though? He's put his whole identity on his ancestry and on his own accomplishments. This whole identity thing is all about Paul, who he is and, and what he's done. He doesn't measure his identity against anybody else in a relationship to anybody else except to say, you know what, I, I think I'm pretty good at this, and other people probably aren't as good as I am. That's who Paul was. At least that's the before picture of who Paul was. Are you this way? I mean, uh, maybe you're not a nerd about religion. Maybe you're not the kind of keener that Paul was. I mean, I was, but, but maybe you're not. But most of us build up our identity, our, our sense of worth, our idea of how we fit in the world around something. Maybe you're really awesome at sports. You're really skillful. You've got agility. You've got strength. You're dedicated. You're going to put the time in to practice. Maybe you're a jock, and that's what your whole identity is about. Or maybe you're so deeply into farming. Maybe you're so invested in 4-H. Maybe you're so excited about animals and growing stuff that you got a John Deere tattoo on your shoulder. And your whole identity is wrapped up in, I am a farmer and I feed cities. Or maybe it's a different thing. Maybe there's somebody all your life who's been telling you you're a loser, that you're worthless, that you'll never amount to anything. Maybe you've heard those things for so long and so frequently that's what you think about yourself. No, there isn't much about me. And you're starting to believe that, and your whole prospect for life is centered around being a loser or worthless. 
I mean, this identity thing is so complicated. And that question is still really important. Who are you? What are you centering your life around? There's so many things in life that you could, could, could make an idol and make central and most important in your life. I mean, popularity is one of them. You've seen people that have done that. Or technology. The utmost geek that has the most, the most gadgets and that's up to date on everything. Making money. Somebody that's just determined that they're going to make money hand over fist. Or those political animals that, that know who's in office and care about their ideas and policies and why they're wrong or why they're right. Or somebody whose sexuality is at the center of who they are, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual, whether they're really popular or whether they're unsure about it, that their sexuality has, has taken center role within their life. Or maybe there's a party animal, somebody who just lives for Friday nights. And that's what it's all about. Or music. Maybe they play some arcane instrument like a, I don't know, a viola. And they're going to master this thing. And they're going to be the best viola player in the whole world. Or maybe they're an academic type. And I am going to get, if not 100% in every course, I'm going to get 98 at least in every course that I take. I'm going to be on the dean's list. I'm going to have that general, governor general's medal. I'm going to hammer down on the academics. All these things are good. But if they take center place in our identity, they become idols. So what's at the heart of your identity? Who are you really? I'm not asking about anybody else to, to put somebody else in the slot. What is at the heart of your identity? It's a question that stems from God's word to the church in Philippi. God's message through the Apostle Paul was a, a warning about finding your identity in anything less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And Paul talks about his own transformation. He gave us the before picture. And then he says, there's been a change in my thinking. Everything that I used to think of as vitally important well, let's drop way lower on the list now. In fact, he calls that stuff rubbish. What he used to put his heart on, what he used to totally uh, define who he was, he now calls rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus. So there's Paul in this letter waving this red flag saying, don't go down any other path. Even impressive sounding stuff like religious stuff, it's all useless if God's not at the center. And Paul is rather blunt about this. He says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of what? Somebody read it out. Yeah, I need it louder than that. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's at the heart of Paul's identity in the after picture. This is what he says is solid ground that we can build a life on. To be found in Christ matters. Why? Why is that so important? Because nothing that we can do actually measures up to the righteousness and the holiness that God calls for from his people. All of our efforts don't measure up I mean, even to our own expectations. I mean, how many times have you said, I'm going to make the best picture in the world, I'm going to draw straight lines, and the amazing horse that you had in mind just didn't appear on the paper the way you thought it was going to. I mean, that's me. And if we do that in our art, how about the righteousness, our, our love for our neighbor, our love for God? Even those efforts, we find that that doesn't measure up. And trying harder, saying, get out there, you can do better, that's not going to help us either. I mean, that's like a pickup truck that has a back wheel stuck in a mud puddle. The more you spin those tires, the further down you're getting without going forward a bit. That's where we are at in trying in our own power to get ahead in righteousness <coughs> that impresses others or impresses God. And there we are stuck then in deep, deep in the mud puddle. Find out that sin actually leads to death. I mean, there's a reason why God says, 
certain things ought not to be done. Because when we sin against ourselves or sin against other people, that eventually stifles them. It stifles us. It leads to death of relationships. Death of our relationship between us and God. It slowly kills our neighbor and ourselves. And sin leads to damnation. It leads to separation from God and His love. Because in His justice, in His holiness, in His great majesty, God can't leave sin unpunished. It's just not happening. And so that doom hangs over our shoulders, or over our heads rather, when, when we're trying this on our own. But there's hope. Because God's not only just, not only holy, He's also merciful. He's super loving. And so God, in that love, comes to His doomed people and He offers help, He offers forgiveness. In fact, He offers to take our place. God the Son, Jesus Christ, came down and was born as a human. He taught about the kingdom of God. And He suffered because of sin. At the cross, he died in order to forgive our sin. In order that the goodness that he had, in order that the righteousness that he had could be extended to people who put their hope and their faith in him. You see, at the cross, God the Father put all the punishment for sin on Jesus Christ. And then he took it off of us. And all of our own failed efforts get stripped away. All of our sin gets washed away. I mean, that's the significance of baptism, isn't it? That the water symbolizes the washing away of our sin because of Jesus' death and resurrection. And we get clothed in white robes. We get clothed in Jesus' success. We get clothed in, in his righteousness. And all who profess faith in Jesus, who make that the center of their identity, are found in Jesus and have life in Jesus. That's the only thing, Paul says, that's worthwhile considering for the center of our identity. That's the only thing worth building a life and, a, and, a, and an identity around. He says, I consider my former efforts garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, even though he thought he had that hammered down. But, a righteousness that is through faith in Christ. A righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. By putting our hope, by putting our trust in the risen Savior, that his righteousness is extended to us. So this means life, this means forgiveness, this means a life with a purpose what would keep us from identifying with him? What would keep us from putting our hope and trust in Jesus Christ? <coughs> Bring us back to that question we started with. Who are you? Because once you claim Jesus and his righteousness as your starting point, then everything else starts to fall into place. Once you're building on what Jesus Christ has done, than sports, and politics, and farming, and good grades, and music, and art, they all start to fall into place. There's room for that kind of stuff. It's not at the center of our identity, though, anymore. No, that's where Christ is enthroned. But all those other things in our life get centered and grounded in Jesus' righteousness. And then there's reason and there's room to flourish in all these other kinds of, of activities. But there's also no room for snobbery in this. Because if we have to trust in Jesus Christ for our righteousness, for, for our central identity, well, then we can't look down our noses at anybody else. Because our righteousness is given as a gift. And any other skill or gift is recognized as also that, coming from God our Creator, our Father. And in each other, while we might have friction and, and there might be tension in relationships, we still recognize that at a heart, they are created in the image of God. 
And therefore, they're valuable to God. They have importance to God as his image bearer. Particularly in the church, where that somebody that Jesus Christ has died and given life and righteousness to, they gain all the more value. And on that basis, there's respect for the people around us. Even if they're not as good at sports as we are. Even if they're not as knowledgeable about this or that as we are. They have their own identity in Jesus Christ, their own skills and gifts. They're part of that body that, that are absolutely essential to make it as beautiful and as powerful and as wide-reaching as the body of Christ is really meant to be. And God delights in his people. You're made in his image. He sent Jesus Christ to redeem you from damnation, from doom, from loneliness. In order that with him at the center of our heart, at the center of our life, the center of our aspirations and dreams for our life, we can build a life that's meaningful, that's worthwhile, that values our neighbor and pours love and care into them and that truly glorifies and loves our God the way that we're created to do. So who are you? I think the author had it right. The one who wrote, you know who you are? God is especially fond of you. Amen. <coughs> sing to the king. We're going to stand and sing to the king together. That's number 474 if you want to open up to the red book.
Heavenly Father, we're really thankful for your provision for us and to rescue us from our own futile efforts and to impress you or impress anybody else and to remind us and assure us that Jesus Christ came to, to rescue us, to be a substitute, taking our sin and, and punishment and giving us life and righteousness and hope and a future. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we think about who we are and who Jesus is, that this can be helpful to put things into perspective, to recognize the promises that you've extended to us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that through these conversations and through reflection on your word, that we can find our hope and identity in Jesus Christ. And if there's people here that aren't there yet, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you move mightily in them, that they can put their hope in life and in death in the faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has fully paid for all of our sins by his precious blood, who set us free but from the tyranny of the devil, who also watches over us in such a way that not a hair can fall from our head without the will of our Heavenly Father. May that give us encouragement. May that give us a place to, to start as we think about who we want to be when we grow up and how we're going to use the skills and gifts that you've given us. And then, help us to flourish. Help us to shine. Help us to use those gifts in, in good ways. We pray, Heavenly Father, with thanks for the young people you've brought here for this worship service and for this weekend. We pray that it can be good and encouraging for them. We thank you for the privilege of, of hosting them for, for lunch and over this weekend. And we look forward to meeting with them this evening again and, and worshiping at Sandy Cove Camp with them again. We pray that you give direction and, and strength to Pastor Zan as he speaks and to all who are given leadership at this pray as well, Heavenly Father, with thanks for those that give leadership in this church family. We're really thankful for the elders and for the deacons that, that you've called to serve here, and for their investment of time and wisdom and, and expertise in giving leadership to this church family. And as we're in the process of selecting new office bearers, we pray that, that you speak through this process and that, that people can be strengthened and prepared already now for, for picking up these roles within our church family. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for, for what we're doing with this whole renewal team. For the blessing of Pastor Keith and the Renewal Lab at Calvin Seminary. And for the way it's making us think and look at who we are and what's the center of our identity as a church family as well. We pray, Heavenly Father, with thanks for the health and the strength that we have. So many of us are strong and young and healthy and many of us have jobs that we enjoy and, and things to do, places to live. You bless us richly and we glorify your name for those gifts. We pray that you strengthen those that, that are weak, those that are frail and fragile, the people that don't feel that they have purpose or, or a space to be anymore. We pray for those that have been widowed, lost their spouse, whether recently or, or years ago give comfort and help us to have sensitivity as a, as a church family. We thank you as well, Heavenly Father, for the sister churches we represented in this sanctuary today. For those at Charlottetown and Milford and Truro. Think of Kentville CRC and Halifax as well. We pray for your guiding and blessing on, on those church families as well. We pray all this really thankful, Heavenly Father, that you hear us and that you guide us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Sing to the Lord, you people of grace. We're going to stand and sing with Psalm 150. And as we're getting ready to do that, I'm going to mention that there's not going to be Sunday school after the worship service today. We're going to have time to meet with our guests and uh, there will not be Sunday school. Let's stand and sing together. You might want to mention tonight too the service. 
Okay, I'll mention that tonight we have, uh, what time is the service? 6.30 service. 6.30 service at Sandy Cove. That's on Davidson Link Lake. Go to Dumfrey and turn right. Left. The other right. Can we sing now? with God's blessing on you. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.